on Straight Talk Africa, the African Union has declared this the year of women's empowerment and development in Africa. But some observers wonder whether the AU can indeed walk the talk. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, May 6th. I am Shaka Sali. And hello Shaka and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll discuss the empowerment of women and gender equality in Africa. It's nice to have you back, Mariama. Well, it's great to be back. Thanks, Shaka, and I'm glad to be here. Coming up later in our SCA inbox, we'll share some thoughts on our topic through your emails, Facebook, and tweets. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, despite reports that Africa is home to several of the world's fastest growing economies, the economic growth does not proportionately benefit women. My colleague, Paul Cisco, has more on the story. Fact. Although Africa's women have made major societal strides, they still face an unreasonable amount of discrimination and inequality. The African Union has declared 2015 the year of women's empowerment and development. African Union Commission Chair Noko Susana Dalami Zuma says it is a key part of a 50-year plan to bring about a, quote, integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa. I would like to see an improvement in women in leadership on the continent, women in business. So those are some of the priorities for this decade. In addition to whatever each woman and each group of women have defined for themselves. Joyce Bandis served Malawians as president from 2012 to 2014. Catherine Samba Panza is the acting president of the Central African Republic. And after building her nation back from civil war, Liberia's President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is guiding her country through the Ebola crisis. You've been able to empower women. How specifically have you been able to do that? What we've done when it comes to uh, professional women, I mean, we've just opened a political space so that more and more of them aspire and participate in political life. But perhaps more importantly, um, we've empowered rural women, women farmers, women marketeers, and we've done that by giving them better working conditions. Um, we've done that by employment opportunities through vocational training. Fact, women and girls are often denied an education on the continent. Education is at the center, not only of women empowerment, but the youth as well. But we feel strongly that we should now move beyond primary education to higher education, to science and technology, to innovation, so that this continent can indeed become prosperous. If there was um, a young lady and wanted to follow in your footsteps, what does she need to do? To don't be deterred by the difficulties that she will face. And above all, get the education that makes you competent to achieve your objectives. Fact. Access to family planning and maternal health services lowers fertility rates and improves economic development. Fact. Lastly, more women work more hours, earn far less money, often none at all, and contribute more than African men to their families, communities, and countries. Gender experts say equality statutes exist but are not effective, enforced, or generally adhered to. Girls and women are still often denied schooling, resources, opportunities, health care, and even denied land ownership rights. Another obvious fact, innocent women and children suffer significantly in male-dominated wars and post-war states. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now, joining us here in our Washington studio is our distinguished guest, Emilia Ajay, an author and a self-development coach, motivational speaker, and a philanthropist. 
She is the author of a book entitled Accelerate Glory A to Z Principles to Success in Life and Business, which offers a lifetime worth of principles and practical tools that will reignite your passion to pursue your goals and purpose in life. Well, Amelia, frankly, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to finally host you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am excited to be on the show today. Thank you. You're most welcome. And of course, as you can see, I'm equally excited, especially because you happen to come from a country called Ghana. Right. Who's the founding president of the Osage Four. Right. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah yeah. was one of the most visionary African leaders, a man who thought about Africa becoming a United States of Africa. Right. Definitely, definitely. We are all proud of Dr. Osajifo Nkroma. You're most welcome. And Portia Kalejea is the 2014-15 Sonke Health and Human Rights Fellow at the UCRA School of Law. The fellowship provides specialized training to top graduates from Southern African law schools in which their legal careers focuses on the area of health, human rights, HIV prevention, and gender equality. She joins us from our VOA studios in Los Angeles. Good morning, Portia. Good morning. I have to say that uh, I am equally profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank you, as am I. Well, you're most welcome, and of course, uh, you even make me feel a little bit tinge of nostalgia, especially because you are in Westwood, and that reminds me of my school days many, many, many years ago at UCRA, except that, of course, unlike you, my home was not the UCRA School of Law. It was the School of Film, Television, and Theater, and Ralph Banche Hall, and, of course, the University School Research Library. Well, it's a wonderful place to be, and I'm glad that we have that in common. You're most welcome, and good luck on the show. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. Yes, country code is one. Before we begin today's discussion, I am joined by Binta Jop, the special envoy for women, peace, and security of the chairperson of the African Union Commission. She also serves as a founder and president of an international non-governmental organization working on issues of gender, peace and development in Africa, particularly with women peace builders. Ms. Job joins us by telephone from the Central African Republic in Bangui. Good evening, madam. Good evening, madam. Good evening, madam. I'm afraid that uh, we probably lost the line. Uh, I'll come back here to the studio and interact with uh, my guest here, Emilia. Right. Emilia, how does it feel like to be on Straight Talk Africa for the first time? Because frankly, I know you have been wanting to be on the show. Was it since December last year? Yes, since last year, but I'm excited. Um, to talk about women empowerment because that's what I stand for and um, helping women uh, to be who they were created to be. You wrote a book, of course, and uh, a very interesting book. Why did you write that particular book? The book is um, basically sharing principles. Life is all about principles and structure. And to be successful, you need to have principles to go by on a daily basis. So my book utilizes um, shared principles for everyday living that will help anyone to achieve their dreams and goals. And why did you particularly call it the way you call it, accelerate glory to A to Z? In fact, where you come from, they call it Z. Right. From A to Z. Right. Mm -hmm. The word accelerate means to faster, um, to hasten. So definitely I felt like we all have to improve in our daily lives on a faster um, pace. And then the A to Z is very easy to remember. We all started learning our, our alphabet from A to Z. So the principles running through the letters A to Z 
makes it easy for everybody to remember. For example, the letter A, I have action and attitude. For the letter B, I have bold and balance. Hmm. In the letter Z, I have zest and zeal. So that makes it easy to remember on a daily basis. Curiously, what inspired you to write that book? Because it seems to be, uh, when you read it really, you find uh, there is a very strong religious dose in the book. Definitely the inspiration came from God. Um, it wasn't my intention to write a book, so I got the inspiration from God, the layout, the title of the book, and I took action and I wrote it. Very interesting. Thank you. Let's go to Los Angeles. Uh, good morning, Poshia. Good morning. Hi. I am terrific. Uh, why are you at UCLA Law School? Why did you specifically decide to do law at this time around? Because in the past you seem to have done several other types of degrees. Uh, well, I've had primarily law degrees. I started out studying economics and law, and then I just decided that I wanted to focus on law. And it took me a while to find out exactly what I wanted to do and focus on. And I happened upon this wonderful program uh, with UCLA, which allows you to specialize in public interest law and policy, and specifically health and human rights, which were my chosen fields. Uh, so that's how I ended up here. I applied and they let me in and I was, I'm still very grateful. Now, who inspired you, frankly, to do law? Um, well, I, would, I think the assumption is always that my father inspired me because he, uh, he studied law formally, although he never practiced. But I, at school, I always just enjoyed history and when I was at the University of Cape Town I had done a dual degree which allowed you to sort of dabble in the Bachelor of Commerce side of things and in the law side of things and I was just much more interested in law I just found that it was a more palpable thing I feel like it affects everybody um, and so it was really it kind of chose me as opposed to me specifically having some sort of big aha moment about wanting to study law and briefly, what would you like to do with it? Uh, are you planning in uh, helping uh, women uh, when you finally complete your courses? Uh, yeah, I'm actually graduating next week. So in terms of my short-term goal, it's to have a good GPA and graduate. Um, and then I'm hoping to build my career in the international human rights um, or uh, sustainable development arena. And absolutely, one of my big, big uh, focuses is on gender issues and gender equality. When we talk about uh, women empowerment, uh, what exactly do you, I mean, what exactly do you get out of that? Uh, what, how do you understand it? Well, there's a lot of um, sort of social, cultural, and structural things that tend to work against the advancement of women. So when you say to me gender empowerment, um, although I consider gender to refer to both uh, sexes, male and female, often when we speak about it, it's, it's biased towards thinking that it's just women's issues, but there's many male issues as well um, that should be considered and addressed. But it's about women having a voice and um, b feeling like they can aspire to do great things in this world. You had President Sirleaf on your program yesterday, she talked about how she hopes her life would um, raise the expectations and aspirations of women, and I would, uh, I wholly agree with that. That's what empowerment is about. And not just raising expectations, but also letting them know that there's no specific expectations, that they can do anything. When you talk about uh, Liberian President um, Erin Johnson Sirleaf, uh, when you look at her in her interview and what have you, uh, do you feel like uh, perhaps that she could be your role model and maybe in some years time we might in fact see a president uh, Portia Karegea? <laughs> I, <laughs> I currently have no uh, political ambition whatsoever. Um, but absolutely she's a role model. Any woman you know that is doing great things and is in such a position is an inspiration to me. I meet women every day just at UCLA. There's some amazing educators there. Um, but absolutely, she's someone I look up to, yes. Very interesting. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter. And we are tweeting live 
follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Empower Women. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. The African Union has declared 2015 as the year of women's empowerment and development towards Africa's Agenda 2063. The gender policy goals for the 54 AU members are economic independence and equal access to resources, equal participation and access to economic opportunities in a globalizing world, equal participation in peace and security matters, equal representation in decision-making and good governance and politics, equal access to education, livelihood, and decent work opportunities, and equal access to prevention, care, home-based support, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. <laughs> I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui. And I have to point out, by the way, that uh, we are unable to bring you the AU Special Envoy for Women, Binta Job, uh, due to some technical difficulties between Washington and Bangui, the capital of the Central African Republic. Let me come back to you in the studio. Of course, uh, it's a pleasure really having you here. Um, when you hear about women being... Uh, shortchanged and what have you, what are some of the evidences? Because from what I have seen, uh, frankly, you seem to have pretty much lived a normal life. You seem to have done precisely what you want to do, and yet you are an African woman. <laughs> but it has always not been easy, and it's still not easy for a lot of women um, trying to break barriers in terms of education, in terms of um, politics and the health issues. So for me, as a motivational speaker, um, empower is one of my favorite words in the dictionary and empower means to make stronger or confidence um, to be able to make decisions and choices controlling one's lives and to be treated fairly so when we talk about women empowerment is increasing the spiritual the health the legal the social and economic strength of women in our community mm -hmm. so it's not about feminism it's, um, it's not about women trying to control the world or men, so there should be no cause of alarm to anybody. <laughs> what, what, what about, uh, you know, someone might say that the uh, majority of the African women, for example, uh, they fall perhaps in the category of being peasant women. Uh, they are having problems, frankly, aching a living to provide for their families because they have to use a very ancient technology, and that is called a hall. Have we ever thought about perhaps uh, doing something uh, that could improve the lives of that type of African woman? Perhaps providing them with uh, a better means that uh, they can use to till the land. Definitely with the means, it's all um, from the banks, grants and subsidies from the banks is really, really helpful. And apart from that training, because even if they get the grants, or the subsidies, they need to be equipped to know how to manage and balance their money. Mm -hmm. So personally, uh, for me, I have, this, I have my, one of my dear friends, he's the CEO and founder of a global women um, organization called the Women Information Network, which basically has a comprehensive 
program that trains coaches women um, to live better lives mm -hmm. and, I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm working with her and next year we'll have programs together where we're going to come to um, Africa and have some coaching with some of the women starting with West Africa. Very interesting. Uh, Portia, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sure you are aware of uh, uh, the Chiboko girls in Nigeria. Correct. What are your views on that issue? Uh, do you think that uh, the government in Nigeria and indeed uh, the international community has done enough uh, to rescue those girls? Well, uh, you know, I'm not part of the government. I'm sure that they've put forward their best effort. In terms of that issue, it's sort of, for me, it brings up the issue of rape as a weapon of war and sort of historically women being considered the spoils of, uh, of war in conflict situations. And it's only relatively recently, actually, only last year that the ICC finally formally put it on their agenda to make sure that like sexual violations and uh, gender-based crimes are on the agenda and are primary as crimes per se that can be charged um, by their tribunal because previously they had to be they're sort of incidental too and often like I, I know that in the I don't know how familiar you are with sort of the international criminal tribunals and how they work mm -hmm. um, they would offer in the Lubanga case, for example, or the um, Katanga case, I think, that there were no convictions for the sexual crimes against women per se. Um, and so that's sort of what that rings for me. It's sad that it's only recent because it's just another iteration of how issues that affect women in general, especially in conflict situations, which leave these women very bereft and like without any of their dignity um, have been sort of put by the wayside. But that being said, it's improving. And uh, the UN system as a whole, there's been three female um, human rights commissioners and the current ICC prosecutor, um, Ben Suda, she's um, a woman. So in terms of the women being represented in a much more in sort of a more prestigious sense it's there but we definitely do have to still walk work on the issues on the ground that affect the women who are the most voiceless thank you very much um, i understand that uh, we've been able to link up with uh, the african union uh, special envoy for women uh, madame binta job uh, good evening madame job yes good evening from bangi Yes, I'm sorry that uh, we could experience those, uh, you know, uh, technical difficulties. Yes, sometimes it's not easy. It's not under our control, but uh, now we are connected. Thank you. I'm glad. I hope you'll forgive us uh, from the deepest, better part uh, of the bottom of your Senegalese heart and soul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Madam, uh, when you talk about uh, empowerment for women, what exactly do you mean by that in as far as the African Union is concerned? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, are, we always say that women, women, African women in particular, are already in power because they empower themselves. And uh, that is the reality. But what we are trying to say that this time what we want to see is to go beyond the declaration that exists on women situation in Africa. We say that there are solutions that exist. So what African Union declared this year is 2015 is the year for women. It's the year to accelerate implementation. It's the year to make sure that solutions that exist can be replicated everywhere. So that's the year we are looking at. And we have look on priorities. Um, you know, since Beijing, um, as we just celebrate the 20 years of Beijing, we saw that we have some success story, but yet we are not there. We are not there in terms of the women in power politics. We are not there when it comes to the reproductive health and rights. Violence against women is still there, um, especially in conflict zone. I'm right now in uh, Central African Republic. It's happening, it's happening in many countries in Africa. So those are things that we say 
But yet, we say that Africa has growth. Africa has growth. But it's not inclusive. It doesn't touch the people. It doesn't transform the economic life of the people. So that's what African Union now is saying. It's time to look into the human, the face of the women of Africa, and that's this year. Now talk to us about uh, some successes, um, Madam Job, because uh, one of the panelists here in her book who says that uh, success depends on what you do with what you have. Can you tell us about some of the successes in as far as the African Union is concerned about women so far? I think when it comes to the, uh, I talk about policy first, and that's because the, the African Union at the level of the Commission is to promote, is to advocate. There is a parity principle in the African Union. For example, you have at the leadership, some level leadership, Madam Zuma is the chairperson this is a strong woman that is leading this organization. We have four other women out of the, uh, the ten, so they are five out of ten. That's the leadership, and we have so many women competent in the commission and other organs in the AU. But we know that when there are policies like the parity, few of them are implementing, even if they adopt. We have a much progressive um, a protocol, the protocol on women's rights, which talk about, uh, um, you know, so many laws that can protect women's rights. But when it comes to implementation at national level by our member states, that's where we are lagging behind. But we have successes, it's possible. Look at the case of Rwanda. It's the first in the world that have more than 50% of women. It's now 60% of women in parliament. That's a success story. It's the first one. So Africa can say they are country. My country, Senegal, for example, will have more than 40% of women in parliament. So now you might say, what, what do the women trust in that parliament, right? So if you go case by case, recently the Namibia election, they're almost reaching more than 40% in the Namibian parliament as well. So, so success story in political exists in many places in Africa right now. We have ministers of finance, so the political participation in the last 20 years is there. We cannot question that women are not competent, women cannot make it. But when it comes to issues, for example, on uh, rape during conflict, it's still there. You know, any crisis we have in Africa have a lot of crises, conflict you find that this is still on the body of the women. So we need to fight those for the men. That's, I think, why Madam Duma have put this position <laughs> as, uh, you know, special envoy to go in areas like here in uh, Central African Republic and see how we can promote the women leadership, women participation and transformation of the Central African Republic because unless the women, because they are the ones that, that are less implicated mm. in the, 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 the bloody conflicts they have, they have uh, gone into these countries. So you need to bring new brains, you need to bring new people, and the women are the less involved in the crimes that have been committed here. So that's what we promote to women. That's why we are making sure that women particip participation is there. And that's why we are trying to make sure that, um, you know, um, in, in terms of the conflict, even the justice issue, the women reparation, but also crime committed against women, we bring them to the justice. So those are issues. Another issue that we are looking for this year is um, really the issues of uh, agriculture. You know, in Africa, women don't inherit land. Many of the issues that we see that uh, when it comes to, to laws, um, yeah, so women don't access to credit. Women don't go to the bank and get a loan. So we wanted that to have, for example, 30% in the redistribution of land to women, the farmers, 70% of women are farmers, but you find that they don't own those lands. So those are the advocacy strategies we are developing for this year. 
We are looking countries that are actually making something tangible for women. We want to show those cases. And we say, if you have political will, if you have the resources and put it on the women, it's feasible, it's doable. It's doable. And we need to do it right now. So that's what the AU Commission, with the leadership of Madam Zuma, and all of us are trying to advocate. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Job. But how do you respond to some critics who will say that uh, the AU and uh, its uh, applicants, uh, the OAU, have really been in place since 1963, and yet there isn't really what you can say is significant change in terms of uh, improving, frankly, the quality of the ordinary African woman. You can talk about successes in Rwanda, Namibia, and Senegal, but we are talking about 54 member countries, and we're talking about many, many years, frankly, since most African countries became independent. To what extent can you say that the AU, frankly, is more than a talking shop, that it can indeed uh, translate that success and make it trickle down to the ordinary African woman? I think that is why uh, when you look at Agenda 2062, the first time we say that this agenda is an agenda centered on the people. It's not an agenda that has been designed by technical, in, um, in a, you know, Addis Ababa or somewhere. The chairperson, Madam Zuma, and uh, many of us have been on the ground to get the aspiration of the people. To say in the 50 years, start with the vision. We might not be there, but let's start with the, with the vision that starts the aspiration of the people. We did an evaluation at the youth. We have the religious leaders. We have the professional. We have uh, the academia. We have the women's group. We have so many people who we counted to say what is the aspiration. And this is the people that we think their demand are put on Agenda 2063. Because if the people are not involved, in the planning, in the implementation, we are missing. Because, as you rightly say, member states cannot do it any longer alone. That's reality. We need to look into private. We need to look into civil society. It is not the African government that are going to change the life of the people. They can take policy. They can have the political will. But without the people themselves, and that's what you are seeing, the people in the street demanding. They are the one now transforming to say, if you don't give us, we are there to demand. And now we say, we the people, so it's not just we the member state, but we the people of Africa, with our government, we want to transform. I hear here, for example, in this meeting, the Forum of Bangi, where I'm representing Madam Zuma, the people, the young people who have taken up to say, now we, are, we want to reconcile, but we wanted also to ask our, mom, our, our mother to forgive us. Of course, and if we have to go to tribunal to be judged, we have done bad. So these are the people we want to see. The transformation have to go through the mind and through the heart of the people of Africa, we the people, no longer only we the state of Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Binta Job, uh, uh, for sharing uh, your perspective with us today. And uh, it is very important, especially because uh, you joined us from the Central African Republic, which in fact uh, is under the leadership of another important lady, Catherine Samba, Panza, a former mayor of Bangi, the Central African Republic. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, but first here is Mariama Jaro. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the fantastic and outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan in Ethiopia. Teresa Idosa from Desi in Ethiopia writes, Women must have an equal opportunity to get an education. Then we have to empower them. 
Receiving an education helps to free women from discrimination. We have to pass legislation which gives women equality. African governments have to adhere to international treaties such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Maria Ma. Take it away again, Maria Ma. Well, thanks, Shaka. On International Women's Day in March, the AU Commission Chairperson, Nukosasana Dlamini Zuma, called for an action plan for Agenda 2063, to include a grassroots approach to gender equality and women's empowerment. She says the agenda should include a political vision of a non-sexist Africa, an Africa where boys and girls can reach their full potential and where men and women contribute equally to the development of their societies. Well, this leads us to our question of the week asking, how can African men and women best promote the women's empowerment and gender equality movement? Well, we asked the question and you sent in your answers. Let's begin uh, with a Facebook post from Patricia Namdi in Kampala, Uganda, who writes, Women's empowerment and gender equality in Africa can be promoted through education by teaching women practical skills. These skills then can be used to create income-generating jobs for themselves. African women should be allowed to own property. Women should also have access to credit and economic opportunities. And finally, African governments should fight against discrimination of women. I think some of those points were brought up earlier, actually, by Madam Jop. Uh, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Uh, use the hashtag VOA Empower Women. And if you haven't yet, please follow us on Twitter. And speaking of it, uh, let's go to a tweet uh, from O.C. Uh, Chigbu, uh, who writes, Our women need qualitative edu education. Train a woman, you are training the nation. Let them have good education. Simple. Well, while we're at it, let's take a look at another tweet, uh, this time from uh, Omra Dengasa, who says, because when you empower women, the continent is improving half or even more of its human resources. Well, Shaka and Guess, very constructive uh, comments here. Your take on it. Very interesting indeed. Uh, Emilia, how do you react to that? <laughs> <laughs> was definitely one of my favorite quotes by First Lady Michelle Obama, in which she says, no nation can truly flourish if it stifles the potential of its women and deprives the contribution of half of its population. So women have always informally been in leadership, in right, starting from the home as mothers, raising kids. Um, so definitely we can contribute to the growth of the economy. Um, and we just, want, we just need that opportunity to do that. Very interesting. Uh, any more reaction from uh, feedback? Any more feedback from... Uh Facebook, uh, Twitter? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we can move on to a posting uh, from Joy Jala uh, right here in Maryland, uh, a suburb of Washington, who writes that African women must have an equal voice to talk about real issues that bring change to our world. We must have the opportunity to become president. 
women must have the right to support organizations that help get children off the streets and into safe homes with proper food, water, clothing, and medical care. I have an orphan foundation in Ghana, and I'm willing to partner in all ways possible to rescue orphans. Well, you are certainly doing your part uh, by helping out, and thanks for that. Uh, while uh, we are still here, let's take a look at uh, one more comment. Uh, this time from Precious Carter of Uyo in Nigeria, who says, We are Africans. We have our own customs and traditions that guide us, just like the West. There are things a man can do and a woman cannot. I think I will say vice versa. So there can't be gender equality. Let every gender play its role to develop our homes, country, and continent. Shaka, it's quite interesting. I'll just leave this one to you guys. Very interesting indeed, and I hope it is interesting for you too. Portia in Los Angeles, your reaction? Uh, yes, it is very interesting. Well, to that, uh, just the comment that went on just now, it is true that men and women are different, but those differences are largely biological, and gender equality is about having political, social, and economic equality. And in that regard, equal treatment socially is not too much to ask. That women can aspire to do just as much as men um, is absolutely something that should be guaranteed. Um, and the previous comment spoke to this as well. The issue, I think the big issues are education and access. I have managed to do all the things that I've been able to do because I was lucky, essentially. Me, my parents had the means and I was able to be educated. I didn't have to struggle in that way. Um, so, you know, I'm in no way, I, if you look at the statistics, I'm in no way the average or the norm compared to African women in general. And, um, you know, in many cultures, there's a lot of gender roles and social norms that basically limit a woman's aspirations to marriageability and their um, and fertility has great value and you should only be a child bearer and a mother not to mention just general struggles against poverty and such and so i think that's what we need to focus on i think what will truly eventually empower women is education because that is the way to economic development and empowerment and for you know for the future so well, your point is well made. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. I'll totally agree. Education, education, education. Well, that will do it for today's social uh, media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, political satire from the diaspora. I don't want you to overstay the power. Because that's a problem with African leaders. <laughs> Poking fun at political and religious figures and symbols can make you laugh, but it can also stir up a great deal of controversy. That and more next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back on a social media note. Uh, next Tuesday at 1400 hours UTC or GMT, I will be on Twitter chatting with Yali Fellows, the young African leaders, about the importance of free and fair media in Africa. So join the discussion next Tuesday, May 12th at 1400 UTC or GMT by tweeting live at VOA Shaka. And don't forget to use the hashtag Yali chat well, well this of course is straight talk africa which is coming to you live from washington i gather that um, i do have to go to the lifeline of the show which are the telephone callers uh, good evening sam from uganda you're most welcome to straight talk africa uh, good evening shaka how are you i am hugely terrific how are you today 
I'm fine. Uh, this question goes to the panelist, uh, Emilia Ajay. Mm -hmm. What methods can uh, women in sub-Saharan Africa uh, apply so that they shift from peasant dependency to computerize the techno technology? And uh, how can they uh, engage themselves into political leadership? Thank you, Shaka. You're most welcome, Sam. Emilia? Sa Aksam, thank you for your question. I think it all boils down to education. Education is key. Without education, you can't have the necessary skills and technology to learn or even to know about what is available in terms of grants or subsidies. Mm -hmm. So education, definitely um, being in the rural areas, that would be very, very helpful because they are the people that lack um, the training in education. So education is very, very key. We'll come back to that because there are people who think the priority perhaps should in fact be providing what they call infrastructure. All right. We'll come back to that. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa to participate in our discussion. Please call us at 202-619-3111. The US country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment. So please don't go away. The AU is recognizing 2015 as the year of women's empowerment and development towards Africa's Agenda 2063. The gender policy goals for the 54 AU members are equal access to information and communications technology infrastructure and applications, eradication of all forms of gender-based violence, improved women's health and reduction of maternal mortality, elimination of gender stereotypes, sexism, and all forms of discrimination, participation of the media, and of food security and nutrition. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidui. And let's go back to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone calls. Let's go to Tanzania. Good evening, David. You're most welcome, Straight Talk Africa. David, can you hear me? Okay, I'm Steve from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Yes, please, from the Hub of Peace, indeed. Uh, what is your question, observation? You have one minute, please. Okay, uh, my question was... Okay, my question was, uh, is uh, to what extent does the African leadership strengthen in the woman because I see like uh, people like uh, Ellen Johnson from Liberia and uh, some others who are strong leaders in Africa, but they are very few. So to what extent does the African leadership strengthen the uh, empowerment of women in Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Poshia, can you respond to that? Uh, did you get the question correct? I think so. I think he was asking what can the African leadership do to um, increase the number of women in leadership positions? Yes, I think you got it. Go for it. Uh, well, they should prioritize that, it should, uh, that issue. They should prioritize the elevation of the women in their countries and implement programs to do just that, that will focus on making sure that more women have access to education because the only way that women will get into these leadership positions is by 
having access to them and to the training that is required to get there. So if they prioritize that issue, educating women, then that is a surefire way to ensure that more women will advance. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Uganda. Good evening, Dennis from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, sir, Sally, and a colleague in the panel. Usually terrific. How are you today? Today I'm quite fine. I must say I'm very disappointed because uh, here is a very important topic for women, and yet we have yet to get a single telephone call from a woman. <laughs> hmm? I think uh, if time would allow, I would, I, would, I would allow my woman to talk to me. <laughs> Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? <laughs> She's still, uh, you know, African ladies, African women are committed now. She's looking for children, trying to lay them on the bed. Give us some foreign aid, please. We'd like to hear a female voice. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to make a first comment. Just uh, Indeed, I'm trying to ask a question as to whether the success of a woman can only be, be measured in terms of women's participation in leadership. Mm -hmm. And it's so because there are situations that are self-determined. More especially mm -hmm. the poverty in, in, in most African states. Uh, it has made even women, by, by virtue of their weaknesses in the, by makeup, it has predetermined women into a poverty situation which is not the desire of men. So if at all we are to improve, I think the general situation and economic situation of men must improve. So that the, dis the, the discrepancy and the, the discrimination of sending a girl child or a boy child to school does not become an issue. And unfortunately, even the leadership in Africa, when they bring about the women emancipation, they feel that is their own issue. And at the end of the day, it affects the performance of women to an extent that women begin to see the leadership as they are the people who are really portraying their own interests. Thank this you. Is not right. Thank you very much, David. Uh... Well, what about that? In fact, uh, there are also others who say, yes, you can talk about Rwanda, for example, which has uh, perhaps more than 63% of its parliament made up of women. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that uh, the reason they are there is not necessarily because it is to promote women empowerment, really, but rather because they are a group of people uh, who can be compromised by the strong male leadership. As I said earlier, women empowerment is not about counting men out. We need the men. It's inclusive. So it's not like we're counting the men out. Mm. Um, but when it comes to the, to the legislative branch, we are still behind. For instance, in Ghana, each constituency is re represented by a member of parliament. So out of the 275 members of parliament, only 29 are women. So you need a quota system like in Namibia, for example. 50-50. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it takes a woman to know the issues affecting women right. to be able to pass mm -hmm. the policies that's going to help us. Because but also, it doesn't simply take a woman. I think it takes a special woman, frankly, because women, just like men, can also be individuals. Most definitely. But as I said, with the education, with the policies, definitely women are going to be more in a position to champion the issues that affect us. I see. Let's see if Dennis's wife is on the line. Uh, Dennis, is the madam on the line? Well, it looks like Dennis, it looks like Dennis is not there. Um, let me come to you, uh, Portia. You've been talking about education, and frankly, it seems to be like the common denominator. It seems the most, to be the single most important tool that can perhaps actually be used uh, to empower women or to empower any human beings, frankly, wherever they are. Because the last time I checked, uh, information is really like a sort of oxygen, not only of democracy, but of freedom, of choice. Um, how do you respond to some people who say that if you educate a woman, for example, you educate a, a neighborhood, a village, you could in fact educate a nation, but if you educate a man, you end up with an individual. To what extent do you believe in that, really? Don't, we, don't you think society should probably be, in fact, uh, promoting both men and women without discrimination? Yes, I agree with the latter part of your statement. Um, there's 
an economist whose name is Thomas Sowell who says that when people get used to preferential treatment, equal treatment can seem like discrimination. So, um, which is the, the problem you run into here, like with one of the comments on Twitter, and I think with what the previous caller was saying, is it feels as though when women want to be empowered or be promoted, there's this, kind of, there's this idea that they want to somehow be put above men or be considered only instead of men. And you were saying earlier that you're, you, you know, you're a bit disappointed because we've had mostly men callers. For me, I'm very excited because I think that there's no way the issue of gender equality or that we will reach gender equality and parity without being in conversation with men. We should be discussing the differences in our genders and looking at what the strengths are and playing to those strengths as opposed to what we've been doing in you know, a generally patriarchal society, which is exploiting the weaknesses of one gender for the you know, benefit of the other. And so I do think so. I think it's a discussion that has to be done with both genders, acknowledging differences, but trying to, make, trying to improve in general as opposed to um, being antagonistic about it. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, well, um, you know as well as I do that uh, there are a lot of people, and perhaps rightly so, who think that uh, the pace of change really has been slow, has been slow. What do you think, for example, uh, in your view, uh, that uh, should be done and can be done in order to make a difference? Because can you, for example, mention one key area, one key area which you think can help African women to move to the next level? I believe that we have policies in place right now and those policies need to be implemented and also be monitored about the progress. Um, because right now, if we are not, in, we have, if we are not monitoring or implementing those um, policies that we have, mm -hmm. we're not even going to go anywhere. For example, the Maputo Protocol, which was adopted by the African Union in 2003, which guarantees a comprehensive right um, for women in the areas of, um, um, of, of, of politics, of health, of um, women controlling their reproductive health and also ending um, female mutilization, that even, as you mentioned earlier, 48 countries have signed for the, for, for the Maputo Protocol. But, but here we, how many have delivered? You're right. So we, so we have an implementation um, syndrome issue and a monitoring issue. So I think that if we really implement the policies that we have while we are creating new ones, we are going to move a step uh, forward. And especially our problems when you look at the African Union, of course, even though they have made some significant improvements at the top, because you have a female chairman, chairperson of the African Commission, which is very important, and out of the 10 commissioners, you have five women, five men. But if you look at the secretariat, it doesn't even translate in the other aspects of their secretariat. Well, on that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Emilia AJ, an author and self-development coach, motivational speaker and a philanthropist, and Portia Karejea, a 2014 and 15 Sonke Health and Human Rights Fellow at the UCLA School of Law, who joined us from VOA Studios in Los Angeles, California. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.